Hey everyone, Jen Amos here. Two things before we begin our show. First, I want to ask you for a little grace in this next episode. At the time of the recording, our amazing guest, Renee Barabad Floresca, was not only sharing her story, but also breastfeeding her newborn and watching her dog and cat all at the same time. I hope you listen inspired that we love interviewing amazing women like you at whatever stage you are in your life. And of course, if you have any questions for Renee, you can check out our show notes on how to get a hold of her, or if we have enough requests, who knows, maybe we'll have her back on the show. Secondly, recording, editing, producing, and marketing our podcast show takes a lot of time and dedication. Each episode takes an average of three times the time it takes for you to listen to one to produce. So if the episode is 60 minutes long, it typically takes two to three hours to get it produced. But hey, it's worth it because of the feedback, love, support, and community we've been receiving from you. It's thanks to our sponsors that make this show financially possible. And now it can be thanks to you. By becoming a Tifa Project podcast fan, you'll have the privilege of listening to our shows first, listening to our shows ad-free, and getting a special shout out in future episodes, and many more surprises. Become a fan today by visiting thephilamwoman.com. That's the philam, short for Filipino American woman with an A for singular, dot com. Thephilamwoman.com. Thanks for listening, and let's get started with the show. Oh, and one more thing I promise. Stick around for after the outro music to hear a bonus segment conversation where we talk about the male figures, particularly Filipino male figures in our lives. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the Filipino American Women Project, a podcast show that shares stories and life lessons told by individuals living or have lived in America that are of Filipino descent and identify as female. I'm your host, Jen Amos, a fellow Filipino American woman, and I'm excited for you to join us. Let's get started. All right. Hi, everyone. Jen Amos here with the Filipino American Woman Project podcast show. And as always, I have my co-host with me, Nani Dominguez. Nani, welcome back. Thank you. Hello. Hello. And uh, we are really excited. Just as we are, we're always excited for every episode because it always means that we get to feature another amazing woman in our Filipino American uh, community. And so today I want to introduce you all to Renee Barabad Floresca. So she is originally from Hercules, the East Bay area. Renee is a Filipina actor, educator, and writer based in Brooklyn. She's a creator of original theater works, Sidewalk Sisters, Nanai Tatai Anak, and Undressing the Fragments. Renee uses theater, hip hop, and storytelling, poetry, and improv to transform personal narratives into creative performances not yet highlighted in society. Renee is a disobedient listener, feminist, dog lover, an avid Yelper, vintage store connoisseur, critical race theorist, special education advocate, rapper, poet, essayist, playwright, Brooklyn College adjunct lecturer, and theater creator. Also, just so everyone knows, Renee is always open for collaboration. Renee, welcome to the show. Hey, y'all. I'm also a mother. I think that's like one thing that I I was like, oh, I'm a mom. And that's like constantly on my mind and like, in a way, transforming my identity, especially as a Filipino American. That's right. And you're a new mother. Is that correct? Yeah, I am a new mother. My first child, I have been a mother since June 25th. My daughter is Ame. And you might hear her groan. Currently, she's sucking my tit um, because she was about to cry as we were starting the podcast. <laughs> so I was like, maybe she's hungry. And she's always hungry. So Ame says hello, everyone. <laughs> hey, girl. Hi. <laughs> I love it. I love your your Instagram profile. Your bio just says "Hold up, I'm titty feeding." And I was just <laughs> I like, know. I was just telling Jen, I love that. <laughs> thing. I think that it's like I try to keep my profile updated to like the thing that's on my mind, 
And I think as a new mom, I, I thought like changing diapers is something that I knew I'd be doing a lot, but like, I didn't realize how often if you're exclusively breastfeeding, you have to breastfeed, especially when you're starting. So that mm. was like, I breastfed more than I did anything else in my life. <laughs> in mm. during the first month of being a mom, it's like, no one tells, I mean, like, I guess in my mind, I just thought that you, you did it like, like we eat three meals a day, like three meals and like maybe two snacks is what's recommended. But like a new person has to eat all the time because they don't even know how to eat and they don't know how to shit and they're learning how to shit for the first time. So yeah, I'm a new mom. Hi. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> so have you counted how many times you need to feed your baby every day? Yeah, I mean, the recommendation is like eight to 12 times. And like in the beginning, it was really hard, it was challenging because one, I think I did not know what I was doing. And I think not having family in New York was really hard because, you know, I have like mothers in my life, like my mom, my sisters are both mothers. I have like 30 something cousins in the Bay Area, but I, it's me, and then I have one cousin here who's not my blood cousin, but we're like blood cousins. But it's still, like, she was in another borough. So it's like, it's like someone living in Hercules and then their cousin living in Derby City. You're not going to see them all the time, you know? And so she helps so much, but like, breastfeeding is such an intimate thing, you know? Like, mm. um, asking, it's something that I feel like you ask very specific people like specialists doctors nurses and then like the people who came through for me like one particular friend maria who's a Kenai and is a mother of two like she taught me something really specific that i was like saying like the kind of knowledge that you need so imperative so it's been a lot so eight to twelve times <laughs> wow but I, you know, sometimes I feed her like more than that in, in the beginning, at least. Now she's more regular where she eats every two to four hours. But before it was like every, it could have been like every 30 minutes for five hours. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh, man. Because they recommend on-demand feeding. So, and it's like just something that you don't talk about or you don't know about unless you're going through it. When my friends who are, when they become new parents... I think they usually, what I find, at least right, right now, I have one that is usually giving like weekly updates of their baby and some of them give like daily updates. But in terms of like the details of breastfeeding, that's not usually disclosed to me at least. Like I, I'm not aware of that. And so I appreciate you like sharing your experience as a new parent and what it takes <laughs> to raise this child, this new child in the world. Yeah, the knowledge is just as new to me, so you're welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Part of why I started this project was in hopes to kind of build a community of other people like me so that I, as life goes on, I have this network of people I can come to for advice. And now that I'm recording this, recording these shows in this way, it's like, oh, cool. If I ever need advice on certain seasons of my life, like being a mother, I got plenty of those recorded on the show now. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, why don't we go ahead and just dive into some of the questions we have here. I'd love for you, uh, Renee, to share how you heard of our project and more importantly, what inspired you to be on our show? Great. Well, I heard about it because you recently interviewed one of my dear, dear friends, JL. And then I was like, oh, let me look at the, like, who else they've interviewed. And you've also interviewed an old friend, Karen, Karen Joy. Yes. Yes. And I just think that it's, I, I had a friend in college or I have a friend in college, Paulo Mardo, who's doing um, long distance and her podcast just got picked up. And I just think it's like incredible that our narratives are being recorded in this way. It's, I think that one of the most fascinating things that I learned when I was going through, I would say like an identity delve. <laughs> When I first transitioned from being a, a teacher to an artist, it was really about learning about myself. And I realized that I lived five minutes away from the library in the Bay Area that held the most Filipino books, which is the Pinole Library. Mm. I grew up in Hercules and it's a five minute drive. 
And it kind of baffled me that I learned that when I was like 27, I think, 27 or 28. And I felt really shortchanged in terms of not knowing resources or having access to books and documentation of people like me. And I think that it's incredibly important. I feel like the younger generation, like in the early 20s, has more access to media and resources and literature that I feel like when I was a kid growing up, I didn't have access to like, not to say that like, this is the ultimate standard, but like seeing people that look like me, like on Crazy Rich Asians, or even just like Rocky Rivera, having like that, having her as a young person would have been such an integral part of like my understanding of who I am. But I Mm -hmm. think that like, because I grew up in a time where there was very limited resources in terms of like exposure to people like me, like there was Tia Carrera on TV. And that was kind of it, you know, like I can't, other than watching Filipinos on the TFC, it was really limited. And I do believe that it had a huge impact on like my desire to be a storyteller and my desire to be the forefront of storytelling because Mm -hmm. there were very rarely, there are very still, it's progressed some, but I think it's still very rare where you see like brown Asian women and that's specific, right? Because like as an actor going into auditions, like they might call me in for like, East Asian, but they're not going to call me back for it because I'm brown and my last name is Floresca, so it's confusing for them, you know. So if they're looking for something more specific, like sometimes they'll call in specifically Filipina, but they're not going to consider me for anything that like my skin tone doesn't match. So I think that like that is in large connected to why I do what I do is because the way that I I roll in society and the way in which society treats me is very specific. And that's where my story comes from. I I love that you share that. I think for myself, very much the same way of just this lack of representation. And even if I were to try to seek out what I could, typically it would be from textbooks, which I'd be fortunate to find in school, but it was hard for me to resonate with them because it's usually like facts and figures about like our history and stuff like that. Or it would come from a place of anger and injustice, you know, of all the discrimination that we face. And there was a time where I was a very angry person and that was years ago, but now I've come to a place where it's like, I want to focus on rewriting our story to be more positive and sharing stories today of where women, people that are like me and look like me and sound like me, where they're at today and uh, what they're learning about themselves today and how they can share that with other women and really just create a new foundation or maybe just a foundation, you know, just uh, just another another layer of uh, whatever we need for our community to feel uplifted and validated and, and like they're not the minority. So I really love that in a sense, you wanted to be the change that you wanted to see in really being a storyteller today. And I think that's really awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And I feel like this is a great platform for other women to continue learning about other women. So thank you for, for creating this space. Yeah, it's it's uh, our absolute pleasure. And this show wouldn't be possible if people weren't interested, like if people wouldn't be reaching out to us or recommending other women to share their story, this podcast wouldn't be going in the direction it's going. I'd love to have Nani chime in because I know early on when she first heard about this podcast, she wanted to join and get involved, however that meant. And so it turned out that she was going to be co-hosting with me. <laughs> so Nani, I'd love to see if you had any any thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I just, I really love the way that we're all so connected to the work that we're doing here. Um, I think for a lot of the people, other people around me, their passion projects are side hustles for them. It's a way to make, generate income essentially, or it's just more of a competitive nature, not, not even just about money, but how many likes can I get? How many followers can I get? How much money can I raise? And for us, it's so not about that. It's more about this community that we're creating and we can kind of get to see the relationship between our effort and the reward, you know, a little more 
instantaneously, I guess. And for a prime example, this podcast is something that you can, you know, maybe share with your daughter later on in life and maybe in hopes it will help her navigate through her own kind of identity struggles and, and experience. I really love that we all come here with kind of the same goal in mind, however close that goal might be to us or not. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Prior to me starting this project, my assumption of other Filipino American women or even just Filipino Americans or immigrants is that they would pick up some kind of stable job, whether it's the military or becoming a nurse, an engineer, a doctor. And so for a long time, I had felt odd because I've been uh, self-employed pretty much my entire adult life. And I've like for the longest time, especially in the early stages, I felt kind of angry at that. And I felt angry that I didn't come from a family that could teach me. I had to go outside of my family and my Filipino community to seek out other people who were in business for themselves and doing their own hustles and stuff like that to learn these lessons. And so, but now with something like as the show, I don't know, I, I kind of just want to put it out there for anyone that's listening, but if you are a nurse or engineer or doctor, or <laughs> if you are working some kind of stable job, we welcome you to come on the show because I'd love to hear your story as well. Because since really, since we've done the show, it's it's been a lot of creative people coming forward and it's it's such a beautiful thing. And it really just comes to show how diverse we are, even though we have some things in common, identifying as women and of uh, being Filipino descent and being in America, we're really more diverse than we, we really know. With that said, uh, speaking about being a Filipino American woman, Renee, I'd love for you to share with us uh, just kind of a little bit about your family background and why you identify as a Filipino American woman. All right, Jen Amos here, jumping into the middle of our show, as I always do, to remind you why this show is possible. So, you know, at the end of every episode, I tend to say, if you didn't catch our guest contact info, don't worry, we'll have those in the show notes. Check them out. I work so hard on them. You're welcome. Well, it's been brought to my attention that our show notes are not as easy to find as I thought, which is why starting summer 2020, the Filipino American Woman Project is proud to be partnering with Captivate, the world's only growth oriented podcast host. Captivate is created for independent podcasters, designed from day one to help you to focus on audience growth and the expansion of your audio influence. One way that Captivate makes our lives easier as independent podcasters is by taking the guesswork out of making a website for your show. That's right, a website for your show. So listeners, starting summer 2020, finding our show notes will be so much easier. All thanks to Captivate. You're welcome, as always. If you're about to start podcasting or are getting burnt out from all the extra work of producing one, like building a website, consider a seven-day free trial, that's right, free, with Captivate by visiting thephilamwoman.com. That's the philam, short for Filipino American, woman.com. Or, you know, check out our show notes in the meantime, which is in the details section of each episode. Once again, you can visit thephilamwoman.com or visit the details section of this episode. Sure. I grew up in the Bay Area in a small town called Perkins. I'm the youngest of four. My mom was born and raised in Manila, and she had 11 siblings, and they grew up in a small area called San Andres Pukid, and she was like one of the main caretakers of her siblings. They're actually my grandmother who just passed away in November of last year. She named her children from A to L. The oldest is A and the youngest is L. So Alina, my uncle Bert, Carmelina who passed away at birth, Davina, Uncle Eddie, Uncle Frankie, Auntie Herminia, but we call her Auntie Name. Auntie Irma, Auntie Juvi, Uncle Kano, and Uncle Leo. And I was raised in like one of those stereotypical big ass Filipino families that like had 30 cousins deep and we were in many ways like our own little clan. My grandmother owned a house in the Mission District in, um, in San Francisco. And 
I just have all these memories of, and it was like one of the biggest houses. And my grandma and grandfather bought it like in the 70s. They bought it with the little money that they had. And my grandfather, because he was in the military, he was able to, my great grandfather, I'm sorry, my great grandfather served in World War II. My grandfather was able to come here, but he couldn't afford to bring all his kids at one time. So mm. my mom was a part of the last batch. So in the span of, I don't know, something like 10 years, they would bring like a few kids at a time or send for one. And my, my mom was a part of the last who were in the Philippines. So she stayed up until she was like a young adult and then um, moved to San Francisco where she met my dad. And my dad is kind of like, he's from the Ilocos region. And he was a part of this gang called the Frisco Boys. And so that has had a very huge impact on the way I understand the Bay Area because my dad's like connections with the Frisco Boys have led him to make decisions in, in his life that have hugely impacted my family. So one of those things I think like as I think as a Filipina that is deep interest to me is my father was actually a meth methamphetamine addict for 17 years. And he only recently stopped. Um, it took him a long time to stop. And he stopped the beginning of 2018. And he stopped because he had uh, did some kind of a stroke. And we didn't really know exactly, the doctors couldn't mean exactly what it was. But I happened to be the only one in my house um, at the time. And I was just visiting. It was January 1st. No one was in the house, which is funny because like eight people live in the house and I was the visitor and I happened to be in the house at the time that we had this episode. And so that was connected to both his addiction and diabetes and just overall health issues. And that day I had like a really serious conversation with my father about dealing with an addict and kind of just get numb to their empty promises and things that are connected with it, the mental health issues, the addiction, the, the action of him doing it and the responses after in terms of like what happens to us and how we respond and all of that. And it, it gets to a point, I think, where you just like, I don't know if you watch Shameless, but the main father is like, he's an alcoholic, drug addict, blah, blah, blah. And the family is just used to it. So after 17 years, I kind of just got used to it. And I think that something happened to me. I think just like things were happening in general, where I was just like always speaking my truth at that time in my life. And I think just now, I remember being at the hospital with him the next day because we had to, we had to see his doctor to follow up with him about what happened the night before, which we were in the emergency room for many hours because his glucose levels were like 590 and they're supposed to be like 135. Oh man. So like, this is like where it's life and death kind of situation. And you know, I'm leaving out so many of the madness and details, but I remember sitting in the doctor's room with him and like, I just like started crying and I told him, Sai, look at me. He didn't look at me and then he said, look at me. And he finally looked and I said, this is what happens when you don't take care of yourself. And I said, I remember saying to him that if you're going to die, if you're going to leave us, you should leave us with at least a little bit of integrity. Put that shit, man. My dad curses a lot because he's an old school dude, but he like he curses a lot. Like he curses like a sailor, he's a military man. I was really real with him and then he looked at me and he just started crying. Um and he didn't say anything to me. And then every day I called my dad um, to see if he was okay in translation to see if he had done drugs again. Because I was so used to it, and then every day my mom would say, no, no, he didn't do it. He didn't do it today. And I remember thinking, like, I should go home. Like, I should go home. In 17 years, I haven't experienced my dad sober. You know what I mean? Like, 
he was high or he was coming down from the high, which is not really sober. You know what I mean? The thought of needing it and the thought of wanting it was uh, like very fresh in him. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to go home. Um, at the time, I was like in a relationship that was kind of like ending um, after like four years. So I went home. <laughs> That's a whole nother fucking podcast. But my mom said, before I went home, she goes, your thought I wanted to go to the Warriors, go to a Warriors game. And at the time that, that I was coming in, there was a Warriors game. And I have a homegirl who works for the Warriors. And then I hit her up and I was like, hey, you're going to be there just to like check in with her. She was like, yo, I got you. So she gave me and my dad her tickets to the game. Aww. And that was like the first time I think like me and my dad ever did anything while he was sober that was like a father daughter. It was like the first time. It was such a amazing experience to just kind of like take it with me. And so like I think that like when I think of my identity as a Filipino American, my father has had such a huge impact on me because like, the way that I see it is, like, I could tell you about every single thing he's done, and, like, you guys would probably hate me. But I wrote a play that, that was uh, in my bio. It's called Nano Sakayama. It's my relationship to my dad and nothing but me. I realized that play was actually played in San Francisco in 2013. I self-produced it. I wrote that play. I acted in it. In California, I directed it. I found my cast, which was a lot of like people who are already close to. At the time, I had been living in New York for so long, and then I cast it, and then I put that show up. And it was all about what it was like for me as a teenager dealing with my dad as a meth addict. And I realized, like, alongside my identity as a Filipina, it's like also the father or the daughter of an addict. It was like a huge part of my identity because we've been navigating. I, I've been personally navigating that for the past 20 years. It's like that has been a huge part of like my home life. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about my family. My mom is just as incredible as the story that I tell you my father because she's the one who's stood by him this entire time. And I remember there was a point where we went to the Philippines and I. My dad had left, and I was in college at the time. This was, like, back in 2005. And I remember going to the Philippines. My dad had left our home to, I don't know, what he was doing um, in the Philippines, to be quite honest. And my mom was like, come with me to the Philippines. I want to separate from your dad. And I remember being so mad at her because wow. by the time... We got there, she was like, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to stay with your dad. And I was like, fuck this shit. I was so angry. I was just like, I was like a young teenager. I thought I knew everything, you know? And I was like, I was so resentful towards my mother back then. And not to say that I agree with the patterns my father has placed on like my mom. Not to say that at all, but I have such a different perspective now on why she stayed and who my dad is, who my dad could be. Yeah. So that's just a little bit about my <laughs> Just a little, just a little. <laughs> Very much a part of my life is the people who have brought me into this world. Oh, absolutely. I think our culture really ties into our parental figures. And, you know, we, we first learn culture through our family and not just our ethnic background or anything, but the way of life. And it sounded like your father had suffered a lot for a very long time. And yeah. I definitely have to give it to your mom for having stuck it through with him. I'm sure that they had a different type of relationship before the relationship you had with your dad, which is probably what I would imagine she held on to uh, throughout all those years of of sticking by him. Yeah. Uh, but I so appreciate you uh, sharing that and can tell that it really is a, a part of your identity. Yeah, very much. Is. I do just want to say that another thing that I think we have in common as Filipinas, or at least 
most of the people that I've come in contact with is a strained relationship with our father, which I can also attest to. Not obviously the same story as yours, but just in general. And it's really an amazing story that you have. And I'm really glad that you've been able to kind of come full circle with him and have that new perspective with both of your parents. Thank you. As an adult. Yeah. I'm curious. So you said once you saw your father uh, become sober, you were able to better understand why your mom stayed with him. And I'm curious to know what that epiphany was for you. I think when he was sober, it made me realize, you know, it's funny because I feel like my dad, even when, when he was an addict, like there were very, very, very lovable things about him still. I think one of those things is like his humor. He just like has a very funny sense of humor and like will call anyone out on his on their bullshit. And he's very much that way sober or as an addict. And he's like a no bullshit kind of guy, but is still very humorous. Um, like I just have this memory of like this is actually when he was not sober, but he drove me to San Francisco you know, to the airport once, and he was just, like, laughing the whole time and spitting out all these memories of, like, of the city when he was back in the 70s, you know, like, he would get drunk and go to the club with all his, like, gang members, and they would just get fucked up, and then they would drive up to Twin Peaks and get more fucked up and smoke more gin, mm-hmm. and just, like, feel, like, super high on life, and... Just like him talking like real fast. It's also how he says it. Like I'm not doing justice of it, you know, because it's like he's like, oh yeah, and then and then I drink so much, and then I and then we go up to Twin Peaks, and then we get so much fucked up, and we smoke marijuana, <laughs> and all. Just like he's just like such a character to me in, in many ways, and just like always makes me laugh. I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> he's just crazy, which is entertaining. Yeah, I, I can just only imagine what type of relationship uh, that is uh, with a parent who has suffered like that for such a long time. A little background on me, I lost my dad when I was 10. And I had remembered what it was like to have him as a father those first 10 years and how pleasant it was having him. And I always like to joke that before my sister was born, um, he loved me more than he loved my older brother. <laughs> I always kind of felt like I was uh, the princess. And so For the last uh, 20 years of losing him, I had defined my life based on how I have lost him uh, as opposed to what he had gifted me because we lost him. And it took me a long time uh, to get to that place. But that said, it's I think when you look at that, you know, look at your relationship with your parents with a wiser lens. You know, I was, I was so focused on how I lost my dad that I had an awful relationship with my mom. (laughs) But when I was able to kind of like look at it later and, and, and mature out of it, you know, to see the sacrifices that my mom went through. And so when I think about my culture, I really think about what it's like to be raised by a single parent. So really, really awesome stuff. And I, I really appreciate you diving into uh, your story with your with your parents and uh, especially your father. When I think of Filipino America, like, you know, um, the BAM, Bamboo and uh, Prometheus Brown uh, music video books. Have you seen that? I haven't. I haven't. Nani? No, I haven't either. Oh, no. really? So, yeah, Bamboo is a rap, Filipino rapper from LA and uh, Prometheus Brown is the rapper in Blue Scholars. He's also Filipino and they have this like, they have this like kitschy like opening and it's kind of like 90s sitcom but with a Filipino American family, like kind of like oh. Family Matters, like the opening of Family oh, Matters, Whole House, but it's a Filipino American family. And like when I think of like that like kitschy idea of like, because there are Filipino American families like that. And when I think of that, I'm like, yo, that's not my family. Like, I grew up around mm-hmm. shit that kids shouldn't grow up around. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Like, I witnessed a lot of things and heard a lot of things that, like, young people should not be exposed to. And that is my, that's a part of who I am. It's a huge part of who I am. That's, and that's how I, I've come to be so far away from life. 
like as much as I love my family, like there are reasons why I also left, you know? Yeah. There are deeply rooted things that I needed to like handle away, you know? Yeah, absolutely. When I ask the question, like how, how, why you identify as a Filipino American woman, we tend to get a lot of different answers. <laughs> when we were interviewing JL, uh, she was saying that even some Filipinos don't identify as Filipino, they identify as their indigenous heritage. So I, I'm glad that question prompts you to uh, share this aspect of your life. I think it just adds more to our overall experience as Filipino American women and really shows uh, how, as I was saying in the beginning, like how diverse we are. And it's not just about how we identify, but how our family, our primary caretakers have shaped our identity. Yeah, I, and I, in terms of me being a Filipino woman, <laughs> I feel like it's the, the overall summary of that is that I am the many parts of me. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is like essentially how I grew up. It's like my mom and I were like connected like so deeply when I was a kid. I've seen my mom go through a lot and because I was the youngest, I was always with her. Like I didn't really play with my siblings because my siblings are five, eight and 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly me and my mom, to be honest. And and like, she brought me around everyone. And she also taught me very specifically like that, like, you know, not in these words, but in many ways, the way that she brought me up with like all these people, she entrusted me with her community. And that's the people who raised me. Like when my mom and dad couldn't come through because of a lack of knowledge or because they couldn't come through, people in my community in Hercules came through. And so I yeah. felt like, I felt like a child of many parents, especially when it came to the Filipino community. And so what shaped me as a Filipino American is all the people my mom exposed me to. And it was a diverse, it was a diverse community, not only within Filipinos, but like all my mom's coworkers who were not Filipino, you know, yeah. and were also the two that were Filipino. And yeah, so I, I feel like a huge part of my identity is deeply connected to everyone that raised me. Yeah. Cool. I dig it. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we fast forward to what your life looks like today? I know you mentioned that, you know, there are certain reasons why you decided to move to New York, but yeah, let us know what your life looks like today. I know you live in Brooklyn. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I live in Brooklyn. My life is so randomly in the day. Like, <laughs> I, I can't even explain it because I'm a freelance. And, yeah. um, and if, you, if you're a freelancer too, then you will know that, like, I work for many companies. I work for many different people. Like, I have, I have an agent, so sometimes I go on auditions. I, I'm, I'm an actor with the Don Buckwall agency and so like I'll get an audition notice like the night before and then I'll be like can I make it I might have to teach right and so mm. I mostly what I teach is theater so I teach theater all over New York City with two companies and those companies are focused on social justice and the other company um, that I teach theater with is teaching theater through feminist ideas so they're really specific to who I am. Like I like to roll with people who I, whose vision that I completely align with. And so it could be that. I just did a cool YouTube glamour editorial called Childbirth in Two Minutes. So that was like a full day of work, which was incredibly fun. So some days I'm just like teaching all day. Other days I'm teaching all day and other days I'm just spending time with my daughter, my dog, and my cat. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also a writer. I just got accepted to the writer's family and I'm starting this week. I got a pretty much full scholarship and I am a poet, <laughs> but I'm going to be earning my MFA in poetry with St. Joseph College. Awesome. It sounds like you have a very eclectic life. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. I think part of part of the human experience and the reality of being human is that we all are really uh, multidimensional. And yet 
uh, America and society almost uh, forces us to be one dimensional, you know, like you're, you just have this job and you work full time or you're just a, a stay at home mom or something like you're almost forced to just like pick one identity. I feel like in a lot of situations, what society tends to expect of us. And so when people fill out our forms, I always ask them like, what, like share one to three titles that you identify with, because I know that there's a lot of us who are just, are just like you, Renee, where you're doing a lot of things, you know, you're doing a lot of things that, that make you really happy and there's nothing wrong with that. So I appreciate you sharing just all the different dimensions uh, of your life <laughs> with us. Yeah, actually uh, one of the, like the most recent random things that I did for acting was through the Aspen Art Museum and I was hired through an artist who was doing a visual exhibit there in November and he hired me to do some text work for one of his opening pieces so for his performance he wanted someone to read from a book that inspired his work and so we like me and my family got to spend like five days in Aspen or four days in Aspen, which we would not have done before, you know, like that's mm. not a place that I would, that's on my travel list, but it brought me to work in like nature. And I love that how random my work can be as an actor. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Cool. Well, uh, Renee, I uh, thank you so much for uh, just sharing so, so much on the show so far. I think it really uncovered some topics that even uh, Nani and I want to dive into more and possibly explore in, in future episodes. So I want to thank you uh, so much for that. Before we wrap up, I actually want to get into my most favorite part of the show, the reason why the show exists. And um, hopefully one day, uh, not hopefully one day, one day we will <laughs> publish a book with a collection of life lessons and stories told by the Filipino American woman. When I had asked you uh, what life lesson and story you wanted to share with us today, you said to fuck up and find out. I love that. And I would love for you to elaborate on what you mean by that and what particular part of your life or story uh, led you to this life lesson. Okay, so I actually just saw that at a miner's cabin like in Colorado and Aspen when um, I was working there. And it was just like in this old, old miner's, probably from like the late 1800s, like a miner's cabin. And on it, it was like just graffiti, fuck up and find out. And I was like, oh, I really like that. Um, I think that is kind of how I lived, started living my life after I left teaching full time. It was just like a series of things happening. So after I um, left teaching full time for five years, the thing that I knew, the thing that was stable for me where I did Monday through Sunday, pretty much seven days a week. I was always at my school. I was always thinking about my kids. I was always lesson planning. Like it was a thing that I committed my whole life to. And then I decided to delve into like full-time artistry. I left, you know, I left this stable job to have no health insurance, to have no steady income. I, at that time in my life, like the person that I was with, we broke up, I was living with them and then I had no place to live. And then I think that like, once I let go of all that shit, like all the things that didn't really matter, all the things that mattered started to come up for me, my family, like spending more time in California. It was a huge difference in my life because now without a full-time job, I could actually visit my family for a month at a time and spend like deep time with connecting with my mom and dad, particularly with my father, who I felt like during this time in my life, if I did not have that significant amount of time, like a month, a week, two weeks at a time, kind of just stay at home, help at home, listen to my dad, talk to him, you know, like if I didn't have those time, right? Like we think money is so important, but I feel like what I realized in quitting my full time nine to five was that like time is more valuable. Like mm. having time with people that I love at this stage in my life is way more valuable. Let me rack up the loans. Let me rack up all these things. As long as I'm doing <laughs> what I love, like all the good things will come to me in the universe. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think for me, as someone who's been uh, self-employed for the majority of my adult life, I, I had worked like part-time jobs here and there that I would eventually get fired from or I would quit. <laughs> but for me, the number one thing that I value over money is lifestyle. And just like what you said, being able to be there with your loved ones. I had recently uh, taken this week-long road trip with my mom like earlier on this summer and I didn't have to report to a boss or anything. I could just, I just brought my laptop with me and I would work in the mornings and then we'd go sightseeing in the afternoons. I want to uh, just applaud you, first of all, for taking that leap and seeing what life is like on the other side of a nine to five job and realizing that although nine to five jobs are still good, everyone, we're not trying to bash on it, <laughs> but for people who are curious to know what's on the other side, uh, I think it's really cool to that you're sharing like what it means, what has meant for you today and how uh, you've been able to use this time uh, to spend with family and really do what you love. Yeah. Yeah. So fuck up and find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The way that I also interpret fuck up and find out is like there, there's also that saying that goes, it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. And I see my husband do this all the time where he just kind of like does stuff until like someone tells him no. Yeah. And I, I like, there's a big lesson in that for me because a lot of my life, I try to make calculated decisions. Like, especially when I took the leap into being a business owner, I felt like I needed to get all my ducks in a row. I had to get my contracts in. I had to get my schedule set and, and all these things. But sometimes, sometimes you just can't plan. And when you kind of let that go and just live life and see what happens, it really makes life a little more interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think also when it comes to like women of color, it's, a lack of entitlement like we weren't raised to think that we're entitled to things so asking for forgiveness versus permission that's not ingrained in us we're taught to ask for forgiveness before we do the thing right yeah, like, yeah that's true also something to like you know really think about yeah definitely yeah no just agreeing with everything that you guys are saying i mean i commend you as well renee because that's a line that I try to straddle a lot just because I'm too chicken to actually like quit my job and do a hundred percent or put a hundred percent of my time into uh, my passion projects and, and creativity. So I love that you are so confident and just bold and brave about what you're doing and you clearly don't sound like you regret it and you sound like you're really enjoying yourself and living your life to the fullest. So I commend you for that. Yeah. So it's agreed. We all like Renee. <laughs> <laughs> we think Renee's awesome. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. Well, I uh, I think we had such a, an amazing conversation today, uh, just talking about identity and parental figures and uh, what life looks like for you today, Renee, and and your life lesson to fuck up and find out. But uh, before we go, do you have any closing thoughts for our listeners? Yeah, I think that in your journey of finding who you are, whether you're Filipina American or not, one thing to do is to constantly ask questions and to ask yourself at every moment, am I doing something that is helping the world or am I doing something that is hurting the world? And so just keep keep looking and searching for how you can be the best version of yourself. And whatever that means to you, keep looking, you know, keep asking and keep looking for who that is. And, and you get there by asking the right questions constantly. Beautiful. Well said. And for anyone that is interested in getting a hold of you, Renee, and learning more about your work and even possibly collaborating with you, uh, how, the, how can they get a hold of you? Sure. It's www.renee, R-E-N-E-E, rises, R-I-S-E-S dot -E -E com. And then I am on Instagram as Renee, R-E-N-E-E, -E, from the Bay underscore. Someone already took Renee from the Bay, so... <laughs> <That's the underscore. laughs> there you go and for our listeners if you did not get that that will also be provided in the show notes all right well renee like i said it's been a pleasure and nani i want to thank you for co-hosting with me as always 
Listeners, if this show resonated with you in any way, please reach out to us. You can learn how to do that in the show notes. Also, if you want to reach out to Renee, that will also be in the show notes as well. Uh, With that said, I want to thank you both ladies for being here with me today and talking about all the amazing things we spoke about. And we look forward to speaking with all of you again in the next episode. Take care now. Yes. Thank you, Renee. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah, because that, I mean, that is something that I definitely want to, um, you know, talk more about and kind of unpack is our collective relationship with our dads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that would be, that's a really interesting topic. Yeah, actually, I'm back. Okay. Um, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> I, Nani, I'm glad that you said that because there is a book, an anthology that I didn't get to fully read, but called Walangia. This was like back in, I don't know, like maybe 2010 when it was published. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that date. But okay, this woman, Lolin, I think they've collected all these stories. And one of the stories was, there was a quote that introduced their story and it, it had to do with their father. And the quote was, it came from something else. It wasn't, I don't think it was a Filipino writer, but the quote was, there's a hole in my heart and it's in the shape of my father. And mm-hmm. I think that is something that a lot of Filip- Filipino Americans, especially um, navigate and tether with because of many reasons. But one thing that I wanted to like, I think it's the sociologist in me that like loves saying the thing that I shouldn't say, but like Filipino dads have, at least where I'm from, have a history of leaving America, going back to the Philippines, marrying a younger Filipina and having, and having a dual life. Right. Um, And I don't Mm -hmm. think that people talk about that enough and how that impacts our psyche as children of these fathers who are living these dual lives. Um, And this is not an uncommon thing. Like I have so many friends who have shared with me either that the father left and stayed there with his other family or came back to be with his, you know, American family. But like that is so deeply embedded in that Spanish colonial like yeah. you know mentality. And my family is not far from that. I think that's mm-hmm. something that's quite common in our in our lives. And I think with colonization and like this idea that like the, you know, the patriarchy. <laughs> I hate to, like, be so cliche about this, but it's, like, it's the patriarchy that's, like, fucking it all up, <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, we, It's kind of, like, this idea men are allowed to just, like, run their lives however they want to run them, and then, like, women have to be there and completely, yeah. like, be okay with it. Could we just uh, take a moment to... <laughs> I, I, I feel like this is like a whole other podcast in itself, but I do want to touch upon this. I mean, if there was a podcast show specifically for the Filipino male experience, mm. I would love to hear that because <laughs> like, okay, here's the thing. I had a tough relate. I had a tough relationship with my dad, obviously, because he wasn't around. And so my life was based off of like the lack of having a father, but also also throughout my life, a lot of the Filipino male figures in my life were very abusive or toxic or just like awful people to be around. Like I think about one of my first cousins who would always yell at me to shut up whenever I would just say anything and it would make me cry. I think about my uncle who kicked me out of his house because I I stood up I stood up to him and and how I felt about my mom and my grandma at the time. I think about my romantic relationships where the men were either avoidant or they didn't share their emotions or they would have anger tantrums or they would just, yeah, they'd be avoidant most of all. Even if they were, even if they were in front of me, it's more of like they were emotionally unavailable. I just, 
I think part of why, and, and I've never been into like white guys, like my husband is white, but I've never been into white guys until I decided to explore another community and realize that there are, there could be healthy relationships out there for me. Like my relationship with uh, Filipino men in general have, has not been the best experience for me. And I'd love to get your ladies thoughts on, on that as well. Having a podcast for Filipino men, which I would eventually love to facilitate setting that up <laughs> as a long-term right. goal yeah. uh, because I think that a, a crucial piece in us kind of navigating our own experiences and sharing with each other and creating this community that we're creating has like the Filipino man is a crutch. We need to understand that. We need to unpack that. And that is just something that like even with my own dad, I don't even know where to begin. The relationships with all the males in my family have been so, so strained for so, so long that it's just kind of like, where do you begin? I think like, in terms of what you asked, Jen, I feel like my relationships in the past, like I don't have that same experience that you do in terms of like having predominantly toxic male relationships. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that my father has like, deep medical, particularly mental health issues that kind of run through for a lot of Filipino men that are going unaddressed. But mm. in terms of like what you were explaining about men in general, like I feel like it's just not just for Filipino men, like them not having emotions. Like I, I feel like I've dated a lot of men like that. Yeah. <laughs> just like not being able to be in tune with their emotions and like and i've dated all kinds of men in terms of like race and ethnicity and culture and i don't feel like that is something that is true for the filipino man <laughs> that's how i feel also i think like what you're saying i think that it would be interesting for us as women to hear <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, guess, I don't know how interesting it would be on their end like how many men would just be signing up for that <laughs> like yeah it's also talking about my feelings but I do think that I think that it is worth a shot I feel um, like yeah, I definitely like, have to be strategic <laughs> yeah those I bet you those shows would be so much shorter and concise <laughs> I don't know. I could be wrong. Uh, but no, Renee, I, I appreciate you saying that in that I also uh, believe that uh, not all uh, Filipino men are like that. And in no way am I trying to like stereotype like the overall <laughs> Filipino yeah. male community. It's only from my own personal experience and maybe even just my own personal bias from you know, what I grew up with. So yeah, but it's always good to get another perspective. And uh, I know plenty of people in a relationship with a Filipino male that are in a healthy relationship, and I commend them for that. And whenever I see uh, those type of relationships, I, I, I almost have to envy them. Because I, I think if there's one thing that I wish I had growing up, even just within my family overall, is just some emotional support. I know it was really difficult or it wasn't really normal for most of my family to even have that themselves. And so I think that was, you know, and with the loss of my dad, I think I had a much higher expectation for men to not only be there for me, but to be emotionally available. <laughs> so a uh, couple of uh, coaching and therapy sessions later, here I am being able to come to terms with these things and, and have this conversation with you ladies. <laughs> yeah. And there you have it, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe if you'd like to hear more stories and life lessons told by the Filipino American woman. If you're interested in sharing your story, please contact us at thefilipinoamericanwoman at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at thefilipinoamericanwoman. Until next time.